I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospect. Today we're going to talk about gold and hot springs and gold deposits and how gold deposits form. Now I'm here at Yellowstone National Park in Montana and I'm taking a look at all the hot springs that, that cover this whole area. The Indians used to call this area the land of a thousand smokes because of all the steam places that come up. Now geologists will tell you that gold deposits form from hot waters like this. Hot sulfury waters and you, you're not here with me right now but if you were you could smell the sulfur in the, coming off in the steam above that water. So let's take a look at this. We're going to go in and dive into the depths of geology of gold deposits like this because there are such things as hot spring gold deposits and well, you know, the gold deposits here in Yellowstone are probably a half a mile or maybe even a mile deeper than where I'm standing. Um, it still is the right geology that makes for gold deposits, and we're going to take a closer look at that right now. So not every gold deposit is of the same type. Um, there's different ones, and so uh, the most common that most prospectors will look for is placer. You can see that on the top because it's a surface deposit formed by the weathering and erosion of a hard rock deposits that deposit in the ground, in the earth, deep below the surface. Now, there's several of these that are shown here. You can see the volcanogenic massive sulfide and epithermal, porphyry, carlin type, and orogenic, and we may do a geology series on each of those individually uh, sometime in the future, but today I want to look at the epithermal type. And actually epithermal is the type that forms closest to the surface of any of these ones that form deep within the earth. And in fact epithermals can form from within 100 feet of the surface down to perhaps half a mile or more. Um, and, and they're very rich and very famous and today we're going to focus on those epithermal deposits because they're deposits that are created by magma, by hot rock that comes near to the surface. And they're famous for their gold and silver deposits and a lesser extent copper and zinc and other metals but they, they make some really amazing gold and silver deposits. Now in general because they're associated with magma with molten rock that comes near to the surface now magma is molten rock that's still below the surface once it pours out on the surface then it's called lava so if it's still in the earth, it's not lava yet. So um, it, you see this ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean is an area of active volcanism, of active volcanoes and other volcanic uh, type of reactions that have happened in the past. And it's interesting because, uh, well, like I say, epithermal types of gold and silver deposits are associated with these. It's interesting also that the areas of magmatic or volcanic reaction is also an area where you see these epithermal deposits. Uh, you can look and see Mexico. Mexico is very famous and some of the uh, the western part of South America and western part of North America. These are areas known for rich epithermal deposits but also in places like Japan and some parts of uh, the islands of Southeast Asia and even New Zealand. So here's a kind of a schematic to show you how these deposits form. You can see that at the bottom we have a pink thing marked there as a shallow intrusive heat source and that's basically what causes the, what, it's what drives the system. It puts the heat in that makes water circulate. You see the arrows the white arrows are showing basically uh, water in the system, uh, groundwater that gets heated by exposure to this. Um, there's faults. Where, the, where there's faults, the water can circulate, and so it comes in from the side and then circulates up the uh, fault zone and comes out on the surface as hot springs, as geysers and 
uh, other things like that. And there's usually what they call a silica sinter zone at the surface. That's what the deposits of the geysers and, and hot springs actually create. But most of the time, the hot springs don't have any um, gold and silver to speak of in them. The gold and silver is further down in the system. But they can be super rich. You know, here's a, a beautiful specimen of gold ore from Goldfield, Nevada, full of, of gold. And, and so, like I say, these kinds of epithermal systems can be very rich. Another specimen from Nevada, from Goldfield, that shows how rich these really can be. Here's a, a, another epithermal beautiful ore specimen. Uh, you can see that the gold in it is much paler in color. This is from Fire Creek in Nevada and was recently mined in the last year or two. Um, but the lighter colored gold is due to the fact that there's a lot of silver naturally alloyed into the gold. So this was a deposit that was rich in both gold and silver. And a lot of epithermal deposits are like that. In fact, there's some epithermal deposits really that are much more valued for their silver than for their gold. You know, I get people asking me sometimes, what does a gold deposit look like when it's forming? Well, I'm here in Yellowstone National Park and this is kind of about what it looks like. We're going to talk about that and go into more detail. So this is what a epithermal anyway, a gold deposit in the act of forming would really look like. And this is called Firehole Lake. I mean, this is a couple of geysers and things at the edge of Firehole Lake. It's a spot in Yellowstone National Park where there's magma that comes near to the surface and there's fault zones that circulate through there and hot sulfury water comes from down below up to the surface to shoot out as geysers and steam and fountains. That's just what it would look like. It's hard for most people to imagine that quartz veins and gold deposits are formed from hot water. I mean, after all, you can't dissolve quartz or gold into water, can you? Well, it turns out that if you make the water really hot and you add some sulfur to the water and you put it under a lot of pressure, well, it actually can dissolve both quartz and gold into really hot, high pressure, sulfury water. And that's really how gold deposits, or at least epithermal gold deposits, form. They, the water circulates through and dissolves the gold and quartz and other metals, and then redeposits it into veins, what, what become veins in the ground. Here's again another one of these diagrams to show you where the epithermal vein actually forms. And it forms, like I say, with a fault zone that the heat source down deep below. And these numbers are in meters, not in feet. So you can see that literally the, the gold vein is, in this particular, the, the precious metal rich horizon is about 500 meters or in the ballpark of 1,500 feet below the surface. And that's a very approximate number. I mean, sometimes there are situations where the precious metal mineralization is only 100 feet or even less below the surface. And there's cases where it's um, even much more than 1,500 feet that it might be uh, several thousand feet below the surface. but the kind of in-between typical thing is you know on the order of 1500 to 2000 feet below the surface because what you have is a boiling level and what happens with these systems is the, the water the hot water circulates through the system and it deposits in there and what happens is there has to be some sort of change or you know alteration of the system to get the gold and silver out uh, they don't just come out for no reason. They come out because something's happened. And this shows a boiling level. In some places where the pressure is reduced, you have high pressures deep within the earth. And as the pressure is reduced, the liquid will boil. And that will release gold and silver. 
Oh, it's also other metals as well. But uh, there are other things uh, that can happen, uh, temperature changes and exposure to various types of minerals. Uh, other things like that can also call, cause the gold or silver to come out of solution. And I showed you, you know, this vertical vein coming up from deep below. Well, here's a vertical vein of that very type uh, in Nevada. This is from uh, the Midas district. And this is a rich gold and silver bearing vein. And uh, you can see the miners have spray painted on there just to show where they're going to do drilling of their holes and how they're going to set the blast to go to mine this material out. But this is basically a real life picture of what I just showed you in this diagram. Now, a lot of times these veins have what they call a banded texture and if you looked at this vein close enough yes you can see it does have the same banded or layered type of texture which happens as the fluids going through there may change a little bit in chemistry and uh, suddenly you're depositing quartz and then maybe you're depositing pyrite and then maybe you're depositing some silver mineral with gold it just changes over time and that's how you get these banded textures uh, as the the nature of the fluid the hot water circulating through the system changes what gets deposited by the fluids that are then circulating through the system can change um, sometimes the banding is really obvious sometimes it's less obvious um, and sometimes the banding reflects base metal minerals so in this particular case the dark colored material is things rich in lead and zinc Here's a specimen of beautiful gold from these types of deposits. Like I say, they produce some really beautiful specimens and some really rich gold. So knowing a little bit more about epithermal systems is really, really valuable for the prospector. Here's another beautiful specimen from Willow Creek in Nevada. Uh, you can see the beautiful gold crystals that are formed on here. Uh, again, epithermal systems are very rich and certainly worth knowing about. You might want to ask, or a lot of people would wonder, where does the metal and the sulfur come from? I mean, if these are deposits of uh, quartz and, and gold and silver and other metals in the form of sulfides, uh, where does that sulfur and metal come from? Well, it comes both from the country rock, um, that, that is the, the surrounding rock because a lot of times in these things where they have explosive volcanoes that leave these calderas and fault zones uh, uh, producing you know long-lived hot springs and, and uh, geysers and fumaroles that it comes from the country rock around there but it also comes from the magma the magma is also a source because even though you think of it as rock and lava, it's got metals in it. Now, we've talked a little bit about Yellowstone and uh, shown, shown a little bit about uh, how uh, it has active geysers. And, and these geysers are the kinds of things that you would see on an epithermal deposit that was uh, forming. And if you were there while it was forming, you know, the the geysers and the fumaroles and uh, hot springs uh, it's it's what you'd see above a forming epithermal deposit now why is there all this volcanism in the Yellowstone area well they've had volcanoes here for millions of years but these are not the kind of gentle volcanoes that you might see in Hawaii where you know thick oozy red lava flows out and flows down the side of a hill and you're only in trouble if you have a house uh, built below the flow of the lava because you can't move the house and you can't stop the lava and so the lava flows down but other types of volcanic eruptions occur very differently and many of you will remember Mount St. Helens. This is not Mount St. Helens, but it's a, an artist's rendering of what might have happened or what it might have looked like at Yellowstone when 
the explosive volcanoes there blew up because Yellowstone is thousands of times larger than what happened at Mount St. Helens and Mount St. Helens killed many people and decimated uh, an area of forest and buried lakes and did all kinds of that. Well, imagine something that was thousands of times larger. And now you're starting to see what happened at Yellowstone. So in Yellowstone, volcanic magma came up close to the surface and caused this gigantic explosion that covered an area for many, many miles. And within this area of the volcano that exploded, geologists call that a caldera. And there is still magma close to the surface. And there have been a series of explosions um, underneath Yellowstone over the last couple million years. And some geologists think it might happen again. Here's a, a, another picture of that, uh, kind of a cut through version. And you can see that the reason there's lava close to the surface at Yellowstone is there's actually a hot spot in the upper mantle uh, below Yellowstone that's pushed molten, uh, you know, magma, molten rock up close to the surface. And where and you can see the caldera, that's where the volcano exploded and blew material out over. And in inside the caldera, what you have now is these geysers and other steam features um, where the groundwater is coming in contact with really hot rock. And so what results is the water boils and you get steam. Now, as the caldera um, emits its steam and that sort of thing, water is circulating through there. Meteoric water is circulating through and deep down below, above the magma, above the molten rock, but well below the steam features that you see at, at places like Yellowstone, are forming epithermal veins. Now, epithermal veins don't form in every place that there's a caldera. Some places the chemistry isn't right, or there's not enough water, or there's not really a good source of gold and silver metal. Uh, but the, uh, the Yellowstone deposit has produced, or the Yellowstone um, the hotspot that produces our Yellowstone uh, features the hot spot underneath there has been uh, migrating underneath the surface of North America, and or basically it's probably the hot. Uh, I shouldn't. I'm saying it backwards. The uh, hot spot is staying stationary, but the North American plate is moving over the top of it, and so uh, it has caused volcanic eruptions in the past. And in the distant past, when it was first forming where you've had chance for erosion to bring these deeper epithermal veins up to the surface in northern Nevada you have really rich deposits of gold and silver. And we're going to take a look at that in just a minute. Now here's a, a, a different but um, further south in in Ure, Colorado uh, there's a caldera at Silverton and Silverton and Red Mountain are uh, both part of the rim of a caldera and there are really super rich uh, silver deposits and uh, gold as well at uh, Red Mountain and these areas are famous for for the the rich veins that they've uh, been mined there. Uh, another famous area associated with a caldera in Colorado is the Summitville area. It was worked as as recently as the 1980s and 90s. This is what I was telling you a minute ago about how the Yellowstone hotspot has uh, moved at, at basically the hotspot is not moving but the North American plate is moving over time and you can see that uh, the youngest things are at where Yellowstone is now in the the northwest corner of Wyoming, but it slides backwards. And you know, the current stuff at Yellowstone is 
600,000 to maybe 2 million years old. Well, you move backwards into Idaho and you get stuff that's 4 to 6 million. You move a little further back, you get 10 million, 11 million, 12 and a half million, 13 million, and then there's even some that are up to 15 and 16 million years old. And just next to that is where a lot of the northern Nevada bonanza ore deposits are. It really is a system that forms rich deposits. Not every single time, no doubt about that. There's not a, a rich uh, gold and silver deposit for every geyser that ever was, but uh, it certainly is a system that works and sometimes does produce some very rich gold. Here's a specimen of, of gold from Willow Creek in Nevada. It's a well-known placer and a hard rock area in Nevada. Even better known and even more productive is this. This is Round Mountain in Nevada. The Round Mountain is pretty much gone. It's a, it's a hole in the ground now. But millions of ounces of gold have come out of here. And uh, unlike some of the other Carlin deposits that produce nothing more than um, nothing more than microscopic gold, Round Mountain produces it produces some you know gold that's microscopic or nearly microscopic but it also produces some very rich specimens like this uh, Nevada is famous for the round mountain gold uh, uh, deposits and because this literally has produced some really spectacular specimen gold and that's all part of the epithermal uh, they think that at Round Mountain there once was a big giant super volcano caldera just like we're talking about at Yellowstone. And Yellowstone is all about the hot water and steam and, and minerals being circulated around and moved. And this, of course, this is the world's most famous geyser, the famous Old Faithful. But there's a lot of water shooting up out of here. And... This water is heavily mineralized and all the material you see on the surface is all silica that's been shot up out of this geyser and other geysers around it because there's several geysers next to it that are, are closed off. You know, they form and then eventually the deposits kind of choke them down and, and seal them off and new ones form. And it just keeps depositing this material. Well, like I say, down deep, it's picking up gold and silver and other minerals iron and sulfur from the from the country rock around it but it's also getting gold and silver and iron and sulfur from the vapors of the magma you see the magma isn't all solid uh, rock remember it's molten it, the, but the magma also has water dissolved in it and it has minerals and, and that sort of thing and when the lava starts to cool down when the magma starts to cool down basically there's a remainder of things that don't fit well into all the other minerals and these uh, end up contributing to the geysers and to the hot springs and that kind of stuff and forming the valuable minerals that we've been talking about and you know it's a big deal here at Yellowstone but these kinds of uh, geyser and hot springs and stuff exist all over the West. It's no special surprise that Nevada, which is the most gold productive state in the U.S., and yeah, Nevada actually historically over all the years of its production has produced more gold than California. Nevada is known also for hot springs and, uh, well, there's not many geysers in Nevada, at least there's not any I know of that are natural but there's loads and loads of hot springs all over Nevada in fact Nevada is a, a big short source of geothermal power that they use the hot springs actually in places to generate electricity and just south of Reno there's a steamboat hot springs that's now a, a power generating site so uh, this uh, hot springs is really uh, an important thing to know about for understanding the geology of gold and how gold deposits form well, as I mentioned, the gold at Yellowstone is likely down thousands of feet, a thousand, maybe 1,500, maybe 2,000 feet deep. No one really knows for sure. And uh, it's not practical to drill into these active systems. 
that are still producing uh, steam and hot water simply because it's rough on the drilling equipment and even if you did find something down there how would you work it it's hundreds of degrees down there so it's not uh, it's not a simple thing the and besides Yellowstone is is a national park so this is really a, uh, at least as far as Yellowstone is concerned it's an exercise in understanding the system not uh, something that you're going to go down and mine some gold at Yellowstone because that's that's just not going to happen but there are systems hot spring systems all over the western US this is one in Eastern California and if you look carefully at it you can see that there is kind of a fault scarp that goes from uh, right to left across this picture and uh, the middle part is where the the furthest distant uh, hot spring pool is and it's these systems like this that are active forming of gold and silver deposits there are known gold and silver deposits in this area and well here's one that's actively forming along a fault where there's hot uh, magma near or at least comparatively close to the surface and the water the groundwater is circulating up through there leaching gold and silver out of uh, out of the ground and redepositing it in systems that uh, perhaps a couple million years from now might be suitable for mining but who's to say we just don't know again I mentioned this how the uh, hot spring or how the hot the Yellowstone hotspot has uh, stayed but uh, the North American plate has slid over it and how that has in northern Nevada form some really rich gold deposits and this is this is a little um, set of uh, um, drawings showing uh, some of the uh, well-known gold uh, areas that either have been mined in the past or um, might be mined in the future and then you can see these dotted red lines 20 ma 30 ma 40 ma these are areas where um, because of the subduction of the Pacific plates underneath the North American plate has led to volcanic action in the state of Nevada and the resulting uh, really rich gold deposits that have formed now uh, this kind of explosive volcano type of thing you know like Mount st. Helens on you know thousands of times greater scale has happened in Nevada in numerous places and not just because of the hot spot as it migrates across or migrates underneath the North American continent it uh, has happened because of subduction as well and these uh, explosive volcanic centers as I've kind of shown are the seats and locations for magma that comes near the surface and results in gold and silver deposits here is uh, a map showing some of the calderas some of the explosive calderas in the state of Nevada and many of these have gold and silver deposits associated with them not everyone but many of them do in different places and it's not just the fact that there's a caldera there that leads to a gold and silver deposit it takes the right kinds of chemistry and the right kinds of faulting and uh, you know various other factors for things to work out of course a certain amount of groundwater is necessary because these deposits don't form from you know just a little tiny bit of water it takes millions and millions and millions of gallons over many thousands of years a lot of geologists think that some of these vein systems take anywhere from 50,000 to half a million years uh, of, of, of hot circulating water to create these types of systems it's not something that forms quickly here's an, another caldera in Nevada further south this is one related probably more to plate subduction and not to things like uh, like the, uh, the Yellowstone hotspot but it's 
it's been a real deep, a real super productor. I showed you some of these uh, beautiful gold specimens at the beginning of this video from Goldfield, and this is the map of the uh, Goldfield caldera. The yellow uh, kind of outlines the zone of the caldera, and you can see the faults within it. And most of the really rich gold deposits in this Goldfield area have been associated with the outer fault. It's basically the fault that goes through the yellow area. Um, what they call a ring fault around the caldera uh, is, is probably, in most cases, if you're going to be looking around calderas, the, the outer ring fault is, in most cases, the best place to be searching. Okay, well, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and that it's given you a little bit of insight into how gold deposits form. In fact, I wrote a book about how to be a better prospector, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that book right now. Okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, I wanted to be able to share the knowledge that I've gained about finding gold and, and how to be successful. And so I spent years literally writing this book, Fistful of Gold. It's more than 350 pages long, which is why I say it's an encyclopedia of everything you need to know about finding your own gold. Um, I've sold more than 8,000 copies and I've got a lot of really great feedback on it. It just is the most complete book on the market. It has information about finding gold that literally is not available in any other book that you're going to find for prospectors because I took technical stuff from geologists and other um, mineral scientists and I've translated that into language that the average guy can understand. You don't need a PhD to go out and find gold, but the information that scientists have learned over recent decades can can be of a lot of help to people. So it's in this book. Uh, if you're interested about finding gold, panning, sluicing, nugget detecting, uh, dry washing, the geology of gold deposits and how they form, it's all in here. And like I say, it's more than 350 pages long. So if you'll just go to the description underneath this video, um, you can take a look. I've got a link in there to take it to Amazon to the site where the book is sold. And I think you'll you'll really enjoy it. Take, take a look at all the people who've commented on this and have really liked the book. It has a, a very, very high rating for a book. And also, I have a, a website, my own free website that uh, you can take a look at. I've got all kinds of information on here about uh, doing research and how to find gold, a lot of good information, stuff that basically uh, couldn't fit into my book. And so I put it on this website and I have a, a link also for that in the video description. So take a look in the description and you can click on the, uh, the link and it'll take you to my website. And finally, if you like this presentation, I've got a lot more coming out. Here's a three and a half ounces of gold that I found a couple years back in one area. Um, I've got a lot more of these videos coming on gold, gemstones, hard rock, placer, a lot of metal detecting. There'll be lots of metal detecting stuff. So if you really enjoyed this, click the subscribe button and then tick the notification bell off and YouTube will let you know when I publish new stuff. And hit the like button as well. And please comment on these videos because I'm interested in what you have to say. And I promise to answer any questions you have. So if you are wondering about anything or think maybe I didn't cover something thoroughly enough in a video, then let me know and I'll be happy to try and help you out and give you whatever information you need. So thanks a lot and um, hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you again real soon.